In this segment, we're going to talk about the kinetic theory of gases. Uh, mainly, we're going to talk about the speeds of gas molecules and how that varies uh, as a function of both the identity of the gas or the mass of the gas molecules and uh, the temperature of the gas. Let's take a look at what, uh, what we mean when we say uh, we're talking about the kinetic theory. So the kinetic theory is really just a model uh, that describes gases. Uh, I mentioned uh, in the first uh, video about uh, ideal gases that uh, it's possible to take this kinetic theory model uh, and from uh, the assertions written down here, these uh, so-called postulates of the kinetic theory, uh, you can basically just do some physics and uh, derive the ideal gas law from these, uh, these ideas. Okay. Uh, the fact that this model explains and gets the same result as the experimentally found ideal gas law uh, is, is reasonably good evidence that the model is, is consistent with reality. Okay. Uh, at the very end of this video, I'll talk about how uh, we can also do an experiment to confirm another uh, result of the kinetic theory that I'm going to uh, put forward in the video. So let's uh, take a quick look at our postulates again. Uh, the first is the molecules are point masses uh, with no volume of their own. Another way to say that is that the, the spacing between molecules is very, very much larger than the size of the molecules themselves, okay? Uh, we say that there are no forces between molecules. The molecules do not attract or repel one another. Individual molecules are in constant straight line motion, meaning a molecule just goes uh, on the path it's on until it bumps into something. Uh, when it does bump into something, that takes us to our next postulate, which says the molecules undergo elastic collisions. Uh, that means they undergo elastic collisions both with each other and also with the, the walls of their container. Okay, uh, So uh, that means that uh, energy is going to be conserved as the molecules uh, rattle around. Okay. Uh, Finally, it says uh, the average kinetic energy uh, is proportional to the temperature of the gas. Uh, I wrote uh, Kelvin temperature there because uh, just like all things related to the gas law, uh, when we say temperature here, we have to be on an absolute temperature scale, which for us uh, generally means on the Kelvin scale. Okay, uh, So that says if I double the Kelvin temperature, I would double the kinetic energy. Uh, be very careful. It does not say if you double, say, the Celsius temperature, uh, you double the kinetic energy, right? Because generally speaking, that's going to be a lot less than doubling the, uh, the Kelvin temperature because of that offset of the zero point. We're going to talk mainly about uh, the, the kinetic energy and the speeds of gas molecules, okay? Uh, so we have a postulate there that says the temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a gas. Uh, it is possible to show that for an ideal gas, the expected result uh, is that the average kinetic energy is equal to 3 halves RT. Okay, uh, that R is the gas constant. Uh, it'll feel weird to say that's kinetic energy if you think about it. Uh, we've been using R, for example, with units of, say, liters and atmospheres uh, over moles and Kelvin, right? Uh, but if you convert that uh, in this equation here, if we were going to use this equation, we would most likely want R to be in, say, uh, joules per mole per Kelvin. Right. Uh, those actually have the same dimensions because liters and atmospheres, that's a pressure times a volume. Uh, pressure times volume does make energy, right? Because pressure is force over area. Uh, so if you multiply, uh, so pressure is force over area. If I multiply that by volume, uh, I get force times distance. I get distance times force. And that's energy. Right. Uh, so the units, the dimensions do work out, even if it feels weird to see that. So uh, this says, <clears throat> uh, if I put in a temperature there, that would get rid of the Kelvin, and it would tell me this is the average kinetic energy then in joules per mole. Uh, so the total energy that a mole of gas uh, would have uh, as a result of the motion of the molecules. Okay. Uh, the average part over here is important. Uh, that's because in a sample of gas, uh, not all the molecules are going to go the exact same speed. Uh, some are going to go quite slow. Some are going to go quite fast. Uh, we'll see shortly uh, a distribution function that actually shows us what uh, the range of speeds would look like uh, and how they're uh, fanned out across that possible range of speeds. That's our main goal for this, uh, this video. If I take uh, that result, uh, which said that uh, the kinetic energy, uh, if I go back to the previous one for a second, kinetic energy is 3 halves RT, right? So that says the temperature determines that average kinetic energy, right? Uh, it, so that says at one temperature, different gases have the same average kinetic energy because there's nothing in that equation. Uh, the three halves RT equation just says that's the energy no matter what the molecule is, right? Because R is universal uh, for every gas. Doesn't molecule matter if the molecules are heavy or light or anything like that. Uh, it's also true, though, that kinetic energy, if you think about uh, physics, uh, kinetic energy is, of course, one half mv squared, right? 
Uh, and so that means if the kinetic energies are the same for different gases at a fixed temperature, then the speeds must be different, all right? Uh, let's convince ourselves of that by just doing a little algebra. Okay. So here are two expressions for kinetic energy. <clears throat> uh, the one I said the average kinetic energy was three halves RT. Uh, the kinetic energy of a molecule is definitely one half MV squared, right? So if I'm going to equate those things, uh, I would say that I could write three halves RT. And when I do this uh, over there for M, I have to be putting the molar mass and not just the uh, mass of one molecule. Uh, so there's a little bit of uh, care to make sure I don't end up with things uh, in very different quantities. If I do that, uh, I can uh, cancel the twos, obviously, right? Uh, and then if I take that thing, suppose I solve it for V squared, I'd get V squared uh, is equal to uh, what? Uh, 3RT over M. Uh, which would say that uh, if I take the square root of that thing, okay, uh, this uh, strange looking quantity over here, the square root of V squared, uh, that thing gives me what, uh, what we could call uh, the root mean square speed or VRMS, where I'm using V here for speed. Uh, which is a little bit uh, physicists wouldn't approve, I suppose, but uh, we're not physicists uh, for purposes of this class, so that's okay. Uh, that thing uh, says if I took uh, V squared for every molecule uh, and uh, I took the average of V squared and then took the square root of it, I would get this V RMS. Okay, that actually is not the same thing as taking the average of V, although at first glance it sort of feels like maybe it should be, uh, but uh, it doesn't work out that way. If you just pick a handful of numbers and do both the average of the numbers themselves and the square root of the average of the square of the numbers, you will see that they don't come out the same. Okay, uh, so what does this tell us? It says that uh, this is this root mean square speed. Uh, it's equal to the square root of 3RT over M. Uh, let's not worry too much about the details like that square root of three piece or the R. Uh, what's it got in here? It's got a square root of T over M. That's its dependence, right? This is a speed. Uh, so this says that uh, hot means fast. Uh, and it says heavy means slow. right? Because uh, I've got T over M. Uh, and so the hotter my gas gets, the faster the molecules move. That should generally be kind of intuitive, I think. Uh, and the heavier the molecules get, the more slowly they'll move, right? Why is that? It's because their kinetic energies uh, have to be the same if I have heavy molecules and slow molecules at the same temperature, right? Uh, so to get the kinetic energies to be the same, uh, the ones with the uh, higher masses have to have smaller V squareds to make that equation work. Okay. Uh, all of that should reasonably make sense uh, if it takes you a second to look at it, just sort of uh, think about the equations and, and it, you should be able to make that uh, feel uh, kind of sensible to you. And again, this main result over here, uh, most people find that uh, to be sort of what you would guess if somebody just walked up and said, uh, you know, which do you think would be faster, uh, hot molecules or, slow mo or, or cold molecules, uh, then uh, that usually is what people would say. So this is a summary of that, uh, that result, right? The average speed, uh, and the only had there is this root mean square. It's not really the average speed. I'll talk about that a little bit in a second, but it's, it's related to it. Uh, it's proportional to the square root of T over M, uh, which again tells us uh, these things. These are the things I think I, I, I would like you to just know, to say like if the molecules are hotter, they go faster. If they're heavier, they go slower. The details of this thing are given by an expression known as the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function, okay? Uh, I'm going to put a uh, an equation up on the slide here in a second. Uh, it's going to be one of the uh, the more imposing equations uh, that we will look at uh, over the course of the semester, but uh, don't be alarmed by it. Uh, I'm going to do my best to convince you that uh, you, you can just think your way through what it's telling us, uh, and then we'll look at graphs of what it actually shows us to get uh, the, the main results from it. So this is the expression for this so-called Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of speeds, okay? Uh, and there it is. It's a little bit uh, intimidating. The things that are in here, uh, let's see, if I start over here, this says number of molecules around speed V over the total. So this is the fraction of the molecules let's say in a speed window, in a, a, a speed range. Uh, 
Uh, if you're looking for an analogy for that, uh, suppose that we had just taken uh, an exam or a quiz, uh, and uh, I showed you a graph that said uh, that, that, you know, 5% uh, of the students had scores in this uh, five point range of, of, uh, of values, right? That's exactly what this uh, function is gonna tell us. It's gonna say this percentage or this fraction of the molecules have speeds in this little slice of speeds, okay? Uh, over here, we're thinking of this as a function of V. V is the speed, okay? So first of all, let's find the Vs. There's a V squared, uh, and there's a V squared in an exponent up there, okay? The rest of it is all constants, like this stuff here. Uh, N sub A is Avogadro's number. Uh, there's a pi. M is the, uh, the, the mass, the molar mass of the gas, since we've got R in here, right? So everything's got to be in per mole. T is the temperature, again, in per Kelvin. Uh, again in Kelvin. Uh, let's look at the functional form and what this is going to do as a function of v. There's a v squared piece here. So imagine if I plot this n of v, uh, this function, versus uh, this is v, right? Uh, the v squared piece is going to start and is going to swoop up. Uh, so v squared rises up like that. This piece is e to the minus v squared, okay? So that one starts at a maximum and crashes down. If I take those two functions, those two pieces, and multiply them together, I'm going to get something that goes up and goes through a maximum and then comes back down, right? So that is sort of the, the just thinking about functions, what you might do in math class way of looking at that equation and saying, like, what's that going to, going to be like? What's it going to act like? All right. Uh, in order to show us what it's going to act like, what I've got are some plots here uh, that actually take that function uh, and uh, map it out uh, to show us what would happen for uh, some different gases and different temperatures. So let's take a look. So this is a figure, uh, this figure is actually in your, your textbook. Uh, I can tell you that the original uh, version of this figure was made by me taking that last equation uh, and setting it up in Excel to evaluate that uh, and just having a, a, a thing that let me set uh, the mass of the gas to get the different gases in there, okay? Uh, these gases, I think, are all at 300 Kelvin or thereabouts, although I don't totally remember uh, that and I forgot to look it up right before starting. But what have we got? Let's look at axes first to make sure we know what graph we're looking at. On my y-axis, I've got this NV over N total. That's the fraction of the molecules in that speed slice around the, the value we're looking at. Okay, that was the left-hand side of the equation on the previous slide. On the uh, x-axis here, I've got the speed in meters per second. Okay, uh, molecules are pretty fast as a reference point. Uh, what, uh, 1,600, 1,609 meters uh, is, is a mile. Uh, so somewhere right around here is one mile per second. Right, uh, just to prove that uh, these things are going at, at, at a pretty good clip. What do we see? Uh, we see that as I go from oxygen to nitrogen to water to helium, my molecules are getting lighter, right? Uh, if I think about molar masses, oxygen is 32, nitrogen is 28, uh, water is 18, helium down here is about four, right? Uh, and so that shows me that as my molar mass uh, decreases, the, uh, the peak, the maximum in my distribution is going out towards towards higher speeds, right? The molecules are getting faster, okay? Notice for all of these things, uh, there's not just one speed, right? It doesn't just say at this temperature an oxygen molecule goes this fast, okay? Uh, there are a few ways to talk about these distributions. One is to find where is the, the top of the mountain here, okay? So that one is what we might call the most probable speed, uh, so-called uh, VMP. Okay, uh, if we wanted to find the average speed, it would be a little bit faster than that, somewhere around here, give or take, uh, what I might label as V bar uh, for average. Why is the average faster than the most probable? The average is faster than the most probable because these functions all have a tail on the high speed side, right? Uh, if I look at it, uh, this uh, maximum here, for example, is definitely below 500. Right? But I've got the function still uh, coming down at 1,000. So the function sticks out further on the high speed side than on the low speed side. The simple explanation for that is it's got zero over here. right? So this end is a, a hard and fast lock. The molecules can't go slower than zero. But they can occasionally go very fast. right? So that asymptotic decay where the function comes back down uh, says I get a tail at higher speeds. The one that we calculated, the one that is the RMS speed, is actually a little bit faster still. It's out there somewhere. Uh, uh, and so if I mark that one, I could say that might be my VRMS. My plot's getting a little messy. Uh, I'll probably show us a, a spiffier one of these uh, in, in class, maybe. 
What else happens? Notice that as I go out uh, to the helium is the most obvious one, but all of them you can see, uh, as my molecules are getting faster, the peak is actually getting wider. Right, it's stretching out to cover more range. If you look at uh, the, uh, the width of this peak uh, for the, the helium, right, uh, it extends over a lot more speeds than it does uh, for the oxygen. Okay? As it gets wider, it also gets shorter. The height of the maximum, the height of the top of the mountain gets, gets lower. Right? The reason for that is, remember that the, uh, the thing we're plotting on the, uh, the y-axis over there is the fraction of the molecules. Right? So uh, that says that the total area under this curve has to be the same for all of them because the sum of all the fractions has to be equal to one. Right? All the molecules have one speed or another. Okay, uh, and so in the helium case, for the very light molecule, they're stretched out across a lot of different speeds. That means there's fewer molecules having any one speed, right? Uh, because I've just got more speeds that the, there are molecules moving at, right? Uh, so that shows us what happens for different masses. Uh, we can also look at a similar set of graphs for different uh, temperatures. Uh, this one is all the calculation is for CO2. Uh, in this case. Uh, mass, uh, mass 44 grams per mole. Uh, and you can see there's a 300 Kelvin, 500 Kelvin, 1000 Kelvin. Uh, and you can see a similar thing happens. The, the appearance of these is similar. Uh, as the gas gets hotter, uh, the peak uh, gets broader uh, and the maximum moves out to faster and faster speeds, right? Uh, so that's just a look at sort of how the speeds of gases vary. Now, if uh, we were actually in a classroom right now uh, and I was uh, showing you these graphs and saying that's what the speed distributions of gas molecules uh, look like, uh, I'd be uh, hoping uh, somewhere in the back of my mind that somebody might, uh, might ask a question and say like, well, how do you know that's what the speeds of gas molecules look like, right? Uh, it seems like it isn't a simple thing to get to know. Uh, and so because I'm an experimentalist uh, at heart uh, and because uh, I, I know a lot about uh, this particular kind of experiment, I did uh, put in a slide here just to show us how we can measure this thing experimentally, okay? So uh, let me say that uh, when Maxwell and Boltzmann put together that equation, uh, they did it by just doing math, okay? Uh, they did not do it by doing experiments and saying this is really what uh, the, the speed distribution looks like. Uh, much later in time, people uh, developed ways to be able to do this experiment. And the first versions of this experiment are, are just fabulously brilliant in how they were done. Uh, this is sort of what a modern version would look like. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so on the, starting over here on the left-hand side, we have some gas. Uh, and all this stuff we're looking at is inside of a vacuum chamber, okay? So I just wrote a bunch of vacuum pumps down here on the bottom. Uh, <clears throat> what those are doing is just pulling away all the, the background gas. The reason for that is we don't want our molecules that are coming out of that source to bang into things. We want them just to keep going on a straight line path. Because what we're gonna do here is basically have a race between molecules. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to set up the, the sort of the starting gun for that race, but this is how it goes. I've got my gas source over here. So that uh, might be just uh, if I'm doing something like helium or neon, I just have a tube there that's got a, a, a decent pressure of gas inside of it, a relatively higher pressure. On the front of that tube, I've got just a teeny tiny little pinhole, uh, a hole that might have a diameter on the order of, uh, say, I don't know, 10 to the minus 5 meters or something like that. Okay, so a tiny little pinhole. Uh, that pinhole with the pressure inside of it will actually just spray it molecules out of there. There'll be just a jet of gas that comes from that. It's a little bit like if you put your thumb on a garden hose and just spray the water out where it goes forward. That's what happens to the molecules. My molecules, I get this cloud of molecules coming out of there. They're going to come to a wall that has just a very small uh, orifice in it. Okay, uh, So that orifice is going to set up a fairly narrow uh, beam of gas. This thing literally is referred to as a molecular beam uh, coming down there. Uh, essentially, all the molecules there are going to be going on this straight line path because they had to be going in that direction to make it through the hole. Okay, so if I have molecules in here that were going this way, say, uh, they just hit the wall, right? So it's going to be only the ones that were moving on this center line that are going to make it through my very tiny hole there to come out. The next thing that happens uh, is I have this wheel here and it's spinning, okay? Uh, there is a, a narrow slit where that black line is drawn on there. Uh, that means I've got a narrow opening in my wheel. So it's going to spin around. Most of the time, that wheel is going to block the gas. The molecules are going to hit the wheel. They're going to bounce off and get uh, slurped away by this pump down here. Okay, But when that slit goes by, the molecules for a tiny bit of time are going to make it through the slit. So I'm going to get now a very narrow little blip of gas. That's the starting gun for my, mo my molecule race. Okay? Because all those molecules are very close together because they had to get through in the very short time that that teeny little slit was there. So here I've got a puff of molecules which are basically all at the same place. Right? Next up, what do I do? I let them go a pretty long way. 
right? Uh, think I let them go like a meter or two maybe, right? Far enough that at the speeds they're moving, the fast molecules are going to pull out ahead of the slow molecules, right? So by the time my molecules get down here, my originally narrow blip has stretched itself out in, in time or in space because the fast molecules are going to get there sooner than the slow molecules. Then I have down here a detector, which could be something like a mass spectrometer that we talked about a tiny bit, uh, which is able to just count how many molecules are coming in as a function of time. Right. Uh, I set up some electronics so that my detector knows when the starting gun went, when that slit went by, uh, and I can actually measure what the speed distribution looks like. Okay, uh, It looks a little complicated. It is a little complicated, but it's an experiment that we actually uh, have at times had a version of in a, an upper level, like junior, senior level uh, chemistry lab course. Uh, so it's one that it's not like a sort of state of the art thing, but it's, it's a little bit uh, of work to do. Uh, but uh, that's how we measure these things. That's how we get to believe that this equation, this distribution function really does tell us uh, the, uh, what the spread of speeds looks like is we've done experiments that tell us this, right? So it's just a little bit of a reminder uh, that chemistry is an experimental science and that's the, the things we believe uh, are generally gonna be the things we can, can uh, match up between what we think should happen from doing uh, doing uh, mathematical models or theories and what we actually see when we do experiments, okay? Uh, that experimental part is not something I'm going to ask you questions about. I just kind of think it's fun to talk about, and I think that there's enough people in the class uh, that are curious about uh, how uh, things work uh, mechanically and all that to, to make it worth uh, mentioning. 